the uh, diamagnetic, which is the opposite of paramagnetic, the two sides of the magnet snap together. All microorganisms and all humus and humates, whether it's a stick of grass or a root, a microbe or old, old humus or even coal, they're diamagnetic and they're attracted to things that are paramagnetic. And when they get together, lots of reproduction happens in the soil, a lot of excitement, a lot of activity. So one trick to get a very low dynamic soil up to be biodynamic <laughs> is to put a source of paramagnetic rock powder in your compost piles where most of the action is going to be anyway. So we put granite and basalt dust in compost piles. And we also uh, notice that on the meter, we have one of these meters at home, we can test out different rock supplies from the quarries. So no two quarries are quite alike. So in our striking range here, uh, the granite rock dust from up the coast or down in Rockport that is sawn, not only is in liquid suspension, that's the basalt tank. That's a coal off the gas So this is Deer Isle and Prospect area granite dust sawn with a diamond saw, and it's going to stay in that cloudy condition for a long, long time, more than we have today to speak about. And it's about 1150 to 1200 is the very most on a meter. Uh, the basalt, third one in from New Brunswick, from Array Basaltec, which is just now becoming available. No, nope, sorry, that's zeolite. It's too far away. There we go. That's 5,000. Most of our topsoils in Maine are 0 to 10. That's how old, weathered a lot of our soil is. If a soil is treated with good compost, or if it's a um, perennial crop, like tree crops, and you're amending it with wood chips and leaves, the diamagnetic uh, level will increase and it will t bring up paramagnetic conditions in the soil because it will attract a breakdown of things that otherwise wouldn't happen. Most of the minerals that are paramagnetic in our soil have no inspiration to become loose and available. On the outside of an old granite quarry, the surface rocks have no charge. The deeper you go into the quarry, the higher the paramagnetic field because it's closer to its most recent molten condition. And that field hasn't been weathered, so you can actually erode or degrade a magnetic field out of rock if it's exposed to weather. So, um, we're having a well pounded right now, and there's a lot of slurry that's coming up. Right. That, that uh, rock there... It can be tested to see. But it should, be, it should be turned into the soil as soon as possible, if I'm going to get the most benefit from it. I shouldn't well, wait till, like, put it into a bucket and let it sit around for till next spring or something. You could add it to your compost, and it would store all the energy it has. Uh, it won't necessarily be paramagnetic. Around here, we don't have that much paramagnetic rock. It's usually metamorphic ledge. So it's low on the numbers. It might be uh, 100, 250, 300. Um, paramagnetism is just another force uh, of energy that can be harvested to increase productivity of soils. It has several other properties. Most of the paramagnetic rock that is mined for its paramagnetic value is sold to other countries to build up their agriculture. And crucifers have a really high speed attitude. If they're like a really cranky baby with colic. You know, if you don't have that bottle of milk ready, you're gonna pay for it. <laughs> so they really want to have their no interruptions in their nutritional supply from seed to finish. If you can keep it vegetative instead of seed producing, which means suppress the phosphorus, manganese, and maybe cut out things with too much sulfates in it, and really keep the magnesium and calcium and nitrate nitrogen high, and it'll touch the sodium, then you'll have fabulous crucifers. You'll have uh, deadly cabbages, things you can scare people with. And, um, but they want no interruption. That's always been the problem is crucifers grown in greenhouse seedling trays usually get starved briefly. So you put them out 
pretty small and young if you have to put them under a row cover. Kale is no different. If you want kale to be really, really sweet and grow furiously, no matter how hard you cut it, then if you can keep on feeding it all summer long, you can take the whole top off the kale plant, it'll make two or three. Take them off, it'll make 10 or 12. But it takes a lot of energy in that annual fast feeding plant to make that work. Broccoli, you can prune it like a fruit tree. If you take the first two or three cuttings and then you're starting to get where the crowns are small, take them all off with some lopper shears or a big pair of clippers or a heavy knife down to just one or two sprouts that are at the very base that haven't shown a crown. It's just a new little sprout. You have this huge root system. Feed it, prune it back, and get out of the way, and then it'll produce another giant mega crown. Uh, manures carry nutrition to plants one way, but even a bacterial-loving plant, given an opportunity, will get its nutrition any way it can. If it comes through a fungal-dominated soil, the chemistry of the plant will be really different and it might not have free nitrates. Trouble with bacterial soils is loads of free nitrates, which attacks pest insects. It's just a guarantee. So a fungal soil, usually there's no free nitrates available in anything, but the plant can flourish as long as that exchange rate is really high. And a squash, of course, is actually very, uh, very happy with soil fungi attaching to its roots, whereas uh, a broccoli and a cabbage wouldn't be. But I would say that the window of nutritional opportunity in the Google pile, which is basically heaps of decaying material, not manure, it's usually wood, brush, leaves, grass, hay, buried under soil. That's all mostly fungal activity going on there, a little bit of bacterial stuff. So it's another pathway to feed a plant outside of its normal range. And it throws the insect world in a tizzy because it can't recognize the plant when the frequency is different. So if you were to ask uh, Phil Callahan this question, he would say, you just tune the plant out of existence according to the insect. You can't see it blind. But if you turn that thing back into a nitrate eater, all of a sudden it shows up on the radar. He did that off and on. He could turn plants off and on. On this side, then we basically turned a nightmare patch into a super fertile garden. If you're already up and you have weeds coming up roughly the same time, you shield the seedlings of the vegetables you want with a strip of half pipe. There's one stuck out in the field or some of them. Mm -hmm. And then you can use vinegar or vinegar with a little soap and it burns the weeds off and you don't have to scratch the soil surface anymore, which just causes you the same thing to occur over and over again. So. We're learning more and more less tillage techniques and getting a whole lot less hours in and getting more crops out of it. The weeding method is vinegar and soap. That'll be the only weeding method we do here. If you can uh, continually uh, vinegar it enough to take, like right now and one, one more sunny day, tomorrow or the next day I'll spray vinegar on that. Keep the chlorophyll out of the witchgrass and it exhausts the witchgrass much faster than if you try to till it. Tilling witchgrass is basically growing witchgrass. The thing about the witchgrass is it's not going to be a very big problem if you can, at this stage, if you can cook it down two more times on a sunny day, then it really takes the starch out of it, literally. Okay. You're trying to exhaust the root. The problem is it got tilled, so we multiplied the rich witchgrass a hundredfold. So now we have to deal with all these eager little beavers and give them a reason not to be there. By the time the second weeding comes around, we'll have to use a uh, big basket or we'll have to use the shield board or a piece of uh, clear phylon or something just to shield the squash as we spray is that we always get an exceptionally high yield of potatoes with very few runts or disfigured roots. And uh, to hill them, we probably won't hill them at all. We'll probably mulch. And what we could do for mulch is I could grow in the middle path here, annual rye, or I could scythe and just cut grass or hay in the field when it's not in its seedy stage and use that as mulch. It takes quite a lot of hay ground to mulch an area this size. I can also go back and buy straw, but at this point, uh, what we've learned is potatoes that are grown in soil that has a deep oxygen zone, the potatoes are usually set deeper and we don't get so many green ones on the top. 
so we can avoid a tremendous amount of hilling. And most years we uh, limit the hilling just to potatoes that are planted in tilled ground. In this case, we'll probably just uh, hill these potatoes only with mulch. And the mulch, if you side that would be, when you put it on, would be fresh or let it dry? Fresh. Fresh, okay.